Welcome back to 12 Days in March. In this lecture, we will resume our discussion of the failing heart focusing on the neurohumoral response. You are highly encouraged to become very fluent in this topic. As a reminder, a PDF composed by Dr. Frank is available at the website, while Dr. Starling is now tutoring for 12 days, as well as offering ballroom dancing lessons. Details are available at the website. So let's launch. This slide tells you everything you need to know about this topic. Central to our understanding of the failing heart is the notion of not meeting the oxygen requirements or perfusion needs of our organs. If you were the body, and a reasonable soul at that, how would you respond to this situation? Hello, I'm asking you a question. Correct, you'd ask the heart to work a bit harder. And if you were an organ such as the kidneys, you would push all the buttons and pull all the levers to regain adequate perfusion. And let me tell you something, that's a whole lot of buttons, and the NBME wants you to know them all before you can return to Kansas. So to be clear, the language of how that heart works harder and how the kidneys restore perfusion is an absolute favorite for the boards. And that language is referred to as the neurohumoral response, with the neuro referring to the autonomic stimulation of the heart and the vasculature. The humoral component refers to the hormonal response generated by the kidney. And where everyone is fluent in the renin-angiotensin system, do note that ADH secretion is part of that team of responders. Before taking the deep dive, I will again highlight how the NBME likes to use pharmacology to underscore or highlight key pathophysiologic processes. In no area is this more apparent than in the neurohumoral response. Drugs that attenuate the sympathetic nervous system demands on the failing heart and those that dampen the counterproductive and self-serving needs of the kidney are easy targets for the NBME, as you shall see. So let's build the algorithm. It's fun. Anyone can do it. It is way easy if you think about the failing heart as causing arterial hypoperfusion. That's right, the same hemodynamic response to volume depletion or hemorrhage. The body is simply responding to a state of hypoperfusion. Nothing tricky or sexy going on here. Bread and butter physiology. The physiologic response is similar to any other cause of renal or visceral hypoperfusion. So here are the players, the sympathetic nervous system, the renin-angiotensin system, and vasopressin. And not to sidetrack, but here is a quick scheduling note on the nomenclature of vasopressin versus AD8. If you appreciate two different types of receptors, V1 or V2, for the same exact hormone, you could understand the different names and functions. The V1 receptor, corresponding to vasopressin, is found on vascular smooth muscle cells and causes an increase in systemic vascular resistance. The V2 receptor, on the other hand, is found on the collecting tubules and is responsible for the antidiuretic functions. Like I said, this is a quick programming note. And finally, before launching, we know from our introductory video that the failing heart is characterized by venous congestion due to the decreased cardiac output. Remember, she is failing to move product forward, so the blood has to go somewhere. So it goes backward in the form of venous congestion. As the blood backs up, it increases stretch or tension on the cardiac myocytes. In response to this wall stretch, the heart releases natriuretic peptides. These peptides are part of the counter-regulatory humoral response to congestive heart failure and will be covered later on in this review. All right, let's forge ahead. The sympathetic nervous system is predictable as long as you think beta-1 and alpha-1. Beta-1 increases inotropy and chronotropy while also stimulating renin release, as we'll review in a moment. As a result of beta-1 stimulation, we have the heart pumping harder and faster for better or worse. As for the alpha-1 response, I've recorded vasoconstriction in our algorithm, but what does that mean? Vasoconstriction references the arterial system, which ultimately raises perfusion pressure, but at the cost of increased afterload. Secondly, note the presence of venoconstriction, which increases venous return and ultimately end diastolic volume. Remember, these are physiologic adaptations directed at restoring arterial perfusion, but as we shall see, they come at a cost. Okay, let's move on to the renin-angiotensin system. As you can see, the initial response to renal hypoperfusion is the release of renin. You should be familiar with the mediators of renin release, and these are shown including beta-1 stimulation by renal sympathetic nerves. The other two local responses include the myogenic response of the afferent arteriole 
and decrease salt delivery to the macula densa. The juxtaglomerular apparatus will be reviewed in the renal section, but it is always useful to think about the triggers for renin release as this topic is not going anywhere. It is sticking around like a recurring nightmare. Speaking of nightmares, here is the rest of this evolving story. Once renin is released, angiotensinogen is converted to angiotensin 1, and ACE enzyme converts this to angiotensin 2. As you know, angiotensin 2 is a potent vasoconstrictor of the systemic circulation. In addition, it stimulates aldosterone synthesis and release, resulting in sodium and volume retention. Do you see where I'm going with this? We have a failing heart. And to that equation, we are increasing afterload and expanding the plasma volume. And you may ask, why is the body trying to expand volume? I can answer that question with two names, Frank and Starling. I think they invented the heart and coined this catchy little phrase along the way. The volume of blood ejected depends on the volume of blood present at end diastolic volume. Gosh, what a piss of those two must have been. That volume of blood present at end diastolic volume is affectionately referred to as preload. And here it is expressed by this pressure volume curve. The pressure can be expressed by tension, and that tension is proportionate to the resting length. Again, that resting length can be expressed by end diastolic volume or the length of the sarcomere. I'm not looking to confuse anyone, but the NBME uses all these descriptions interchangeably. I just want you to be prepared. So we don't need to beat this to death. I just wanted to remind you what the body is up to and why both sodium retention and venoconstriction are occurring in the first place. All right, we're doing good. We looked at the sympathetic nervous system and the renin angiotensin system. The final leg of the neurohumoral response in restoring arterial perfusion is the release of ADH. Besides regulating the plasma osmolarity, the other principal function is to help expand plasma volume. And although ADH is involved in the regulation of plasma osmolarity, the body chooses to restore volume even at the expense of plasma osms. In this example, you can see one of my heart failure patients with a low sodium due to excess free water absorption. The body is trying to expand end diastolic volume at the expense of plasma osms. And to be clear, and thank you to the young Dr. Nolan who highlighted this issue. The renin angiotensin system is the key player overall in restoring plasma volume. ADH is merely a contributor. So that is the layout of the neurohumoral response. As you can imagine, the physiology derivatives are many. So let's explore a bit further. Although we covered this as we went along, you can see the integrated response, namely in regards to increasing the systemic vascular resistance and in expanding plasma volume. This is an innocent and appropriate response to arterial hypoperfusion. Remember, however, we are dealing with a failing heart. And as we alluded to in our discussion, these physiologic responses to the failing heart does generate some deleterious consequences in the form of increased cardiac work and volume overload. More importantly, these pathophysiologic effects become the target of pharmacologic interventions and, of course, test derivatives. And here they are in a nutshell. All of these are targets for the NBME, but they are also the therapeutic interventions we use in everyday patient care. So what are they? In brief, we use adrenoreceptor antagonists in the form of beta blockers such as metoprolol or combined alpha-1, beta-1 antagonists such as carvedilol. We also use combination therapy. Got that? The combination of nitrates and hydralazine to reduce both preload and afterload. Moving on, we can attenuate the deleterious effects of renin angiotensin activation using any or all of the above agents. ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers are used to reduce vasoconstriction, while loop diuretics and or aldosterone antagonists are used to reduce plasma volume and ongoing fluid retention. Other components of our management strategies include fluid restriction to manage both volume and hyponatremia associated with ADH release, as well as inotropic support in refractory patients with decompensated heart failure. Do note that I include digoxin as it still rears its head on the boards, although it doesn't get much clinical attention these days due to its narrow therapeutic window. Of all of these strategies just mentioned, you need to be familiar with those that offer a survival benefit. So the beta-1 and combined alpha-1-beta-1 antagonists are shown to reduce mortality. The combination of nitrate and hydralazine therapy have also been demonstrated with a survival benefit. ACE inhibitors, 
ARBs and aldosterone antagonists have all been shown to prolong survival. So any of these agents may be target of questions on prolonging survival in patients with congestive heart failure. Equally important are the classes of agents that do not prolong survival. I'm talking about inotropes and diuretics. These are used for symptomatic management in decompensated heart failure, but they have not been demonstrated to prolong survival. These two are targets of test inquiry, as in which agent does not prolong survival in patients with congestive heart failure. And that leads to our final topic of discussion, atrial natriuretic peptide and targeted drugs. So what do you need to know about natriuretic peptides? As the name implies, their job is to get rid of sodium. But drilling down, Although used clinically, they are rarely mentioned as a diagnostic test on step one. They are more interested in testing your knowledge of their physiologic function. So they will talk about a peptide in a patient with decompensated heart failure and ask physiologic derivatives that we'll cover on the next couple of slides. You should be familiar with the fact that they are released in response to myocardial wall stretch as occurs with any cause of volume expansion. This slide is really the key to understanding the beneficial effects of the natriuretic peptides. Through preferential vasodilation of the afferent arterial, I'll say that again, preferential vasodilation of the afferent arterial, they increase GFR and thereby decrease renin secretion and its downstream effects. ANP also has a direct inhibitory effect on sodium reabsorption in the proximal convoluted tubule. These combined effects are pretty darn beneficial, but wait, there's more. ANP directly inhibits aldosterone secretion from the adrenal gland in addition to the indirect effects related to loss of renin secretion. The net result is a further decrease in sodium and thereby water reabsorption. That's pretty good too. There couldn't possibly be additional effects. OMG, this peptide is almost too good to be true. It again demonstrates direct and indirect effects, this time as a vasodilator. It directly increases cyclic GMP to reduce vascular afterload in addition to its effect on suppression of angiotensin II. Likewise, it attenuates ADH binding to the V2 receptor, mitigating these effects on fluid retention. You gotta be kidding me. This hormone does it all. That's the good news. The bad news, all these effects become a definite target for physiology questions on the boards. And now you have to ask, what are the pharmacologic implications, if any? Well, we know that natriuretic peptides are major players in responding to venous congestion, but in terms of treatment, we need to answer the question, if a little is good, is more even better? Let's see. By way of background, ANP gets metabolized by neprilysin. Neprilysin is described by a number of terms, including a neutral endopeptidase or just a peptidase. It is also described as a metalloprotease. Sorry folks, I didn't invent this stuff. You need to be familiar with all these terms. Moving on, if we inhibit neprilysin, the result is more ANP, which results in naturesis and vasodilation, as just reviewed. But here come the trial results giving synthetic ANP did not, and that's a big not, it did not produce favorable clinical trial results. That is, ANP therapy alone, in the form of niseratide, was not clinically successful. But when the endopeptidase inhibitor, secubitrol, was used in combination with valsartan, did you get that? In combination with valsartan, an angiotensin receptor antagonist, a decrease in mortality and congestive heart failure admissions were observed. So ANP infusions alone did not work, whereas neprilysin inhibitors in combination with an ARB did work in clinical trials on patients with reduced ejection fraction. And as always, you have to have familiarity with the language of the boards. An endopeptidase inhibitor is initiated resulting in prolonged activity of an endogenous polypeptide hormone. Are they kidding me? Do you see ANP or neprilysin even mentioned? Endopeptidase inhibitor and endogenous polypeptide hormone. Shame on them for their deceitful language. So coming back to this earlier slide, does therapy with an endopeptidase inhibitor confer a survival benefit? Well, only if used in combination with an ARB. So remember this slide from five hours ago, describing the failing heart and the neurohumoral response? If you think of only the heart and kidneys and what the heart can do to work harder and how the kidneys can improve their perfusion, you will understand the neurohumoral response. And if you're a real glutton for punishment, you can take that response and apply some pharmacologic principles and have a ball like we just did. 
I don't promise much, but I can guarantee the principles discussed in this presentation are going to rear their heads again and again and again. But if you remain focused on these tenets of the failing heart, that being arterial hypoperfusion and venous congestion, the whole house of cards makes perfect physiologic sense. And with that, Drs. Frank, Starling, and myself bid thee adieu. If you have any questions about any of this material, drop any of us a line here at 12 Days. Nice chatting with you today.